Welcome to tonight's uh, lecture, which will be on air traffic control. And Chris Taylor, a fellow of the Royal Air Nautical Society, is going to take us through it and he's going to mis demystify, almost said mystify, uh, the concepts and how that's all going to work. He's worked in engineering, international airspace, air traffic control, design. He's the change manager, he's a Six Sigma expert. Uh, and he's spent the last six years uh, developing the Nats Future Strategy. Anyway, um, my lecture tonight, um, I'm going to do uh, an introduction for myself, um, talk about Nats, um, talk about how air traffic control works, um, and I'm going to take you through a typical flight through our domestic airspace. I'll then move on to talk about the need for innovation um, and our response to that. And with that, I'll include some examples of how NATs have innovated. Um, I'll then talk about our vision for the future, um, which has obviously been impacted by COVID. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll finish off by saying how important innovation is uh, and the need to carry on innovating is. OK. So uh, I've been in NATs for 21 years. Uh, NATs is the UK's main uh, air traffic control provider for some of the world's busiest and the most complex airspace. Now, in my 21 years, I've seen us through uh, some awful events, such as the 9-11 terrorist attacks. I've seen us through the recession in 2008, uh, the issues with the volcanic ash cloud and the impact that that had on aviation across Europe, and now COVID-19. But the big news here is that aviation always bounces back. So that's the positive note. So about me, so I've worked in operations at Swanwick and at Presswick Centres. Uh, I've also worked at Manchester and Southampton airports. I've worked in engineering where we uh, upgraded the Swanwick systems. Um, that's our main control centre for the London uh, flight information region, which we'll be talking about. Um, those upgrades were done in a transparent way um, so that there was no impact to the service that we were being delivering uh, and, and the upgrades were done whilst in live traffic operations. I've also worked in ops support, um, working on international airspace projects and air traffic control uh, procedure design. So lots of work with the French and the Belgians and the military. Uh, more recently, I've been working in change management, I've got a background in Lean Six Sigma and business improvement. And then more latterly, uh, the last seven years, I've worked as part of the innovation team, leading teams to run research projects, exploring new ideas, developing new concepts for product development within the aviation industry. Um, I'm an active member in the society. Um, I'm a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, I recently got my chartered engineering. Um, I'm also a committee officer for the Solent branch. Um, for a while, I was the lecture programme secretary. And in this picture here, you can actually see myself with uh, Frank Whittle's son, Ian Whittle, and we're sitting in uh, one of the seaplanes that sits in the uh, Solent Sky Museum. We had the rare opportunity to be invited up into the cockpit where uh, general public aren't normally allowed. I'm also a member of the Chartered Management Institute. Um, I have a private pilot's license, which I've held since 1999. And um, I discovered, I've just recently picked up my airspace magazine, uh, and in here is an article actually about NATS through this pandemic. So if you have a read of that, for those that received that magazine, you might see uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight as well. So what do NATS do? So we operate control centres to manage the UK airspace. We provide air traffic control services at airport towers. So this is where we uh, win the contracts to, to provide a service. Uh, we aren't the only providers, but we are the main provider within the UK. Uh, we also provide aviation services uh, internationally um, to airlines, other air navigation service providers, governments and the military, and we work in over 30 countries around the world. We're also a leading member of initiatives and alliances such as the single European Skies CESAR um, consortium. The company is around about 4,000 employees, um, about a quarter of those sorry about a third of those make up our air traffic controllers and about a, a quarter of those make up our engineers uh, the rest of the company is made up of air traffic service assistants or others others being functions such as 
uh, personnel or HR um, and finance uh, or innovation. So the UK airspace. So I'm going to talk a lot at the start of this lecture about 2019, because in order to understand the impact that COVID has had on our, um, our environment, I need to understand where we were just prior to that. So in 2019, we handled 2.54 million flights, which was a service that was growing at a rate of 1.2% year on year. We handled over 250 million passengers through our airspace, and we did all that for just under 10 seconds of delay per flight. So I'm going to show you a short video of what the airspace looked like on a day before the pandemic. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing and reshare that because I've just been informed that the sound wasn't coming at that time. Um, you shouldn't have missed anything um, as it was just music. Right, hang on a second. Okay. So every time I watch that video, um, I'm, I'm amazed. I always see something I haven't seen before. I've seen that video lots of times, but uh, there's always something new in it every time. Okay, so how does air traffic control actually work then? What do we do? So we split the business. We, we um, have an en route air traffic control. And the en route sector is controlling all the planes that are over, generally overflying uh, the country. And we split the area up into what we call flight information regions. So the orange uh, blocks on here are our domestic flight, into, uh, flight information regions and we split that uh, north and south as the Scottish and the London FIRs and together that, that airspace covers 1 million square kilometres. It takes 11% of Europe's airspace and actually carries 25% of European traffic through that airspace. We also control over the ocean um, from uh, 
a place called Shanwick, which doesn't really exist. Shanwick is a combination of Shannon and Prestwick uh, combined because some of our, um, our transmissions go from Shannon, but the center is in Prestwick, hence the name Shanwick. Um, and they control uh, over the ocean and that covers uh, an even larger area, uh, which is about twice the size and handles about 80% of the North Atlantic flights. So the centres that I've mentioned there, so we've got Presswick uh, up in Scotland, uh, which uh, again before the pandemic would handle uh, on average 3.4 3 um, thousand flights a day. And at that Presswick centre we have our Oceanic Control Centre. We also have the Scottish Area Control Centre for the Scottish FIR. And we have the Manchester Area Control Centre, which is a hub for the busy airspace around Manchester and Liverpool airports. At Swanwick in the south, um, they handle uh, 5,500 flights a day. And there we have uh, the London Area Control Centre, which covers mainly England and Wales, and also the London Terminal Control Centre, which is a hub centred around our busy airports uh, around London. We also have the military, uh, military air traffic control who work side by side with us, uh, coordinating their flights uh, amongst civil civil flights. And uh, at Whiteley, which was where I'm based, uh, it's just down the road from our Swanwick Centre. Uh, we have our college for air traffic control. Uh, we do all our training there. Uh, our engineering is based at that centre as well. And we also have something called Aquila. Aquila is a joint venture with Thales. Um, and it's a joint venture for the MOD where we provide engineering services to support a lot of the MOD airfields within the UK. So how do we keep the aircraft separated? Well, we apply some simple rules. Uh, the first one being that we separate by the thousand foot or the other one being that we can separate horizontally. In the upper airspace where the aircraft are moving faster, we apply five miles, five nautical miles separation between our aircraft. In the lower airspace, things are generally flying low, uh, lower and slower, and so we can reduce that down to three miles. So that's our en route business. Now we move on to the airports. So in the UK, Nats is responsible, has contracts to provide services at 13 of the UK airports, which you can see in blue. We also uh, partner on a joint venture with Ferrovial uh, in Spain, um, where we've become a joint venture called Ferronats, and those are the orange ones you can see on the, the uh, outline of Spain there. Our Aquila services are all the purple ones, so they're generally the MOD, but also Gibraltar as well. And if you look at an airport, um, this is a typical layout, this is Heathrow, so they sit right at the top of that very tall tower, and the picture in the middle uh, depicts where the controllers position themselves in that tower. Now, if you can imagine, it's like a wedding cake. So the highest tier is the one uh, where you can see the controllers in the foreground, and they are our air controllers. They're looking after um, the picture on the bottom right hand side. They're looking after the movements on and off the runway. So they're clearing things to land, take off and position on the runway. The second layer of that cake, you can see um, slightly further back, they, we have controllers who are controlling the ground movements along the taxiways, as you can see in the other picture there. So a typical day Heathrow, um, we would manage 213,000 passengers, or in flights, that's 1,000, almost 300 a day. Here's a day at Heathrow.
So now I'm going to take you through a typical flight. Now, at this point, I normally ask the audience to participate, but I'm not going to get most people participating through this. So I'd just like you to think about the flights that you may have made. Have you ever flown from Southampton Airport, my local airport? The next question is, have you ever flown to Glasgow? I've flown on this flight several times because that's our route to our Presswick Centre, where I go and see our colleagues up at Presswick, the Scottish um, Area Centre. So up until recently, this route was managed by Flybe. Um, they've now been taken over by Logan Air, and this is one of their flights uh, on Embraer 135. And you can see on the right hand side, the sort of route that it would take through the airspace, going from the green dot Southampton to Presswick, where the red dot is. So typical flight. So the airline will file a flight plan at least four hours before the departure. And the reason they do that is to put that flight into the system the system being something at Euro control, where they will look and say, is the airspace this flight going through congested or are there any issues, uh, activities that are going to make the, um, the number of, of planes that controllers are managing more than they can handle? If it is, this is when the, a slot is picked up and a slot is a time that's allocated to the aircraft uh, to make sure that it avoids those uh, busy congested times through that airspace. So the first thing the tower will do um, is consider the impact to the taxiway system when the aircraft wants to push back and stop. We look at that slot parameter. So they're allowed a, a window of minus five minutes before that slot time to get airborne or plus 10 minutes afterwards. So there's a 15 minute leeway around that slot time if they get one. The tower will issue the push back and start and then when the aircraft's ready, it will call for departure and the tower will issue instructions to taxi. Whilst the aircraft's pushed back and taxiing, the tower will then um, call the London Control Centre to request clearance for that aircraft into the UK airspace structure. So before the aircraft is cleared to enter the runway, the tower has passed that clearance of how to get into the airspace to the pilot. They will also consider what else is on the runway or if there's anything else waiting to land. Once it's clear, the aircraft can then line up on the runway. The tower then consider any separation from the previous departure or aircraft in the vicinity of the airport. So there might be things flying through the overhead, for example. They'll also consider the wake vortex implications because every departure leaves trailing vortices that you sometimes perhaps see on a Formula One car on the rear spoiler. Those, those uh, wake vortex um, spirals that you see are very dangerous and quite often invisible. They could flip an aircraft if, if allowed to take off too close to that wake vortex. So the controller is looking out for that and ensuring that there's a time separation before clearing it for takeoff. The words clear for takeoff are only used at this moment. Takeoff is never mentioned to the pilot until this moment. And the reason being is because of the safety implications. At all of the points when the controller talks to the pilot, they will refer to um, the takeoff as a departure until it gets to the runway and it is actually cleared for takeoff. So our aircraft got airborne and it's now entering this airspace here on the right hand side. If you look here, this is the zone around Southampton and to the left or to the west, um, we have the zone around Bournemouth. And these stubs either side of those zones allow the aircraft uh, a volume of airspace that's protected to enter uh, the airway structure. So the radar controller that you see on the left hand side is controlling this bit of airspace and we'll separate our departure from inbound traffic to Southampton or to Bournemouth and anything else that might be flying around within the Southampton zone. And then it will integrate it into the main airways traffic once it's clear of any traffic that he may be handling. So our aircraft started in the control zone here at the bottom. It's gone through the control area and now it's going to join the airway system before getting into the upper air routes. So the airways and the upper air routes, in this case, are controlled from Sw Swanwick, our centre uh, for the London Flight Information Region. Now it starts its journey in London Terminal Control Room. So uh, where Southampton's positioned, 
you'll see in a minute that it skirts the edge of our London terminal manoeuvring area, the busy airspace around the London airfields. Now, this team of people, some of my colleagues here, you might have seen before because they were on a BBC show called The Skies Above Britain. Here they are hard at work on the controller workstations. Uh, you can see on the map on the right hand side at the bottom here you can see the Southampton zone and you can see the airway structure here and this is this, this is where it's showing the route is just cutting or just skirting on the edge of the London terminal maneuvering area this shaded area on the map. So these controllers will ensure that our departure is separated from all the aircraft inbound to the London uh, airports and keep it climbing up into the upper air route structure. Now the way in which the airspace is managed is in what we call sectors, which are volumes of airspace. Now you can see in here we've got these different colours on the map. So we talk about splitting and bandboxing these sectors. When we're bandboxed, as you can see here, these two yellow ones, Cowley and Wellin are the names of these sectors, they're joined together and the controller has one frequency for the two volumes of airspace. When the traffic gets a bit busier, they'll call another controller in to help with one of the sectors and they will split and we'll have two separate frequencies. So you have one frequency Carolyn and one frequency Wellin. And that's all about managing the controller's workloads to make sure that we're operating at safe limits. So our aircraft now has uh, gone through the airway structure and it's climbed up into the air route structure. So these are the upper air route um, sectors. So our flight would have started at the bottom here, gone through London, a route through up through Daventry into the Lake sector. And here you can see the controllers on the left. This is in our Swanwick Ops room that would be controlling this flight through the London flight information region. When the aircraft reaches the boundary um, between the FIRs, it gets handed over to our Presswick Centre, you can see here. You can see all the banks of controller workstations in this lovely new building uh, up in Presswick. So it's gone from the Lake Sector now into the Dean's Cross, Centre, uh, Dean's Cross sectors where it begins its descent. As it descends out of that airspace, it will then start to talk to Glasgow Approach Controller. You can see here on the left, in this tower on the right. So the approach controller will vector the aircraft, that means giving it headings and directional turns, um, to sequence it. So there's an order um, of how the aircraft will come into the approach sequence. And the reason for that is that they want to keep it separated from other inbound traffic. And just as I talked about wake vortex being a problem um, for the departures, it's the same for arrivals. And you can see in this picture here, this is an aircraft landing at Glasgow and you can see those vortex trails quite clearly. Uh, the, the, air, the air in that spiral is very violent and if you had a, uh, a small light aircraft caught in that, it would easily flip it over. So we make sure that we're well spaced out and that the aircraft are unaffected on their approach and they get a nice stable approach into Glasgow Airport. So once the aircraft has established itself on this final approach path, it's the job of the next controller then um, in the tower. And here's the tower controller on the left, and that man there is responsible for the um, runway you can see here on the right at Glasgow. And they'll check is the runway clear of any other aircraft or vehicles, anything that's um, just departed is clear of the runway, and they'll clear it to land. Once it's landed and slowed down, the tower controller will then issue taxi instructions to the aircraft to tell it, take, tell it where to park or where to taxi to stand. And that'll separate it from all the other aircraft on the ground. This is where controllers sometimes talk about um, this being like playing with a, a big um, train set, if you like, and the aircraft have to follow the tracks, which are these yellow taxi lines to the stands. Once the aircraft uh, reached its stand, the involvement with ATC comes to an end until they're ready to depart again. So the pilot will park the aircraft, shut down the engines and go through all the checks. And once the engines have stopped, the ground uh, handlers will move in, open the doors, get the stairs ready, cargo holds and commence the disembarkation of the passengers. We just recently created an app called Plane Talking and Plane Talking is uh, a really good way if you want to look at some individual flights, 
you can go online. If you just search for plain talking and NATS, um, you'll, you'll find this very easily. Um, and it will take you through the different transmissions that occur between the pilots and controllers for different flights around the UK. So how has air traffic evolved? I'm going to show you a short video of air traffic control, how it's evolved over the previous 70 years. So as you can see, we've been innovating for a long time, um, but we can't stop there. There's, there's more demand coming. And yes, we're in the pandemic and yes, there's a downturn in traffic, but this need will come back and we have to adapt to that. So in 2019, the UK handled 2.6 million flights a year, carrying over 285 million passengers. At the time, the government was forecasting that by 2030, traffic will rise to 3.25 million with 355 million passengers on board. So at the time without significant change, the UK could experience 50 times as many delays by 2030, only 10 years away. One in three flights would be delayed by more than 30 minutes if we don't change. So despite COVID, we need to be prepared to return to these levels. And I'll talk a bit more about the impact of COVID uh, a bit, bit later on in my presentation, but we need to build back and we need to build back better. Plus, who will be the future users of airspace? It's not going to stay the same. What will they need? How do we all need to change? So there's a need to be different. And again, this is normally a question I'd put to the audience and see if anybody could recognise 
this, this well-known place? Perhaps you don't. It is, in fact, the old headquarters for Kodak, a company that didn't evolve, didn't move with the times. And as Darwin said, it's not the strongest of species that survive, but the most adaptable. And that's where we need to be. We need to adapt to COVID and all these other changes. The rate of change in complexity uh, is increasing exponentially. New technologies are emerging quicker than ever before. Our customers are demanding more and more. Their expectations are higher. We're under financial pressure and we're regulated as well. So we have regulatory pressure to conform and to adhere. 2019, uh, this is our airspace in London in 2019, and you'll see how busy it is. you can see just how busy that complex airspace is some of the busiest airspace in the world when traffic does return we can't sustain growth in that environment we do need to change we do need to make things different uh, not just for capacity reasons but for the environment too we need to make sure that our aircraft are getting the best profiles uh, burning the least amount of fuel uh, for the routes that they need to take through that complex bit of airspace our controllers like to call that knitting you can see why so what's our response to this? So we, we founded um, what we call space, a space to innovate and animate. We created space as a place to think, to brainstorm, innovate, to escape the gravitational pull of today. We want to be launching ourselves in tomorrow. We needed a futuristic environment that would push our thinking and mindsets to a new place. Space is a scarce and valuable commodity. We need more space to think, more space to act, more space to see into the future. So we believe with space, our innovation centre or our innovation incubators, we provide a capability to create a real step change, not incremental change, but step changed innovation. We want to make sure that when we embark on these problems that we're trying to fix, when we're looking for the opportunities, that we really understand what's the real opportunity, not necessarily what our customers are saying, but getting right underneath the, the skin of it, the customer and understanding what is it, why do they need it, and, and what's the real question here that we need to address. A lot of what we do is, is creating a common language through visualisation. So we need to bring things to life, make it real for people. All the outcomes that we deliver are designed to exceed our customer expectations. We always want to go one step above where they're expecting to go. And we do this in collaboration. We believe in strength, in collaboration and in diversity, bringing all sorts of walks of life and experiences 
to the party to come up with new novel ways of thinking. So space is about people at the heart. So we have innovation facilitators, we have a team of designers, backed up by human factor specialists to uh, make sure that all of our uh, designs are safe and compliant. We do a lot of software engineering and system engineering. And all of this is managed in a portfolio to ensure that we uh, are managing both showcasing events such as this, as much as we're managing uh, the actual innovation projects themselves. The two need to live together. We need to be able to showcase, to demonstrate um, our performance and to create investment into the, the projects that we want to do tomorrow. So we have three facilities, three space rooms, three different sites, one at Presswick, one at Swanwick, and one at our corporate center. All of them have these uh, creative areas. You can see there's, there's the white sofas in the middle. If you look at this, this top left picture here, we have the same in this room here and the same in this room here. They all have controller workstations. These are so that we can fast time prototype. We can put things in front of controllers and we can project it onto large video walls. You can see at the end of the room there. These video walls are a way of putting a crowd of stakeholders around uh, a console to see how controllers are managing, performing with the new changes that we're prototyping without everybody leaning over their shoulder. It just gives people a bit more space to think about things and work, work problems through. Each of these rooms has uh, very much collaborative tools in there. We've got uh, electronic whiteboarding, um, video conferencing facilities where we can hook up all the rooms. And in fact, all three rooms will connect together in one giant simulation that can connect to our even bigger training uh, facility at, uh, at Whiteley. So we can have a massive uh, simulation capability within those rooms too. So what's Nat's done to date? Well, environment uh, is always on the agenda. We had targets for 10% reduction uh, of CO2 by 2020. We've now moved on. We've now aligned with the UK's net zero emissions target by 2050. And we've set some proximate goals for 2030 where uh, we're including a 35% reduction in emissions from when we, when we started this um, back in the noughties. We do this through uh, the operational partnership agreement. And this is where we meet with our customers face to face with the airlines to discuss improvements to procedures, changes to airspace, the way in which we route our aircraft the way in which we allocate the levels that they get, the, um, the, the, the altitudes that they're going to fly at to make sure that they're operating at the most efficient uh, flight profile they can. We have tools to see into the future. Um, this is something we call IFACs. These are our future air traffic control uh, controller tool, tools. Um, these help us to predict where the aircraft is going to be 18 minutes ahead of where it is. Um, you can see here these 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 what we call vector lines, which is showing the route where where that aircraft's going to be. We can also see here the vertical profile. So there's our aircraft. This is the level it wants. We can see if there's any conflicts of traffic within that uh, climb profile that it wants to go. And this is its operating envelope as well. So we can see ahead where the conflictions are going to be. These tools haven't taken away the controller's job. It's actually enabled them to handle more aircraft. So they've now got. Uh, capacity to handle up to 40% more than they previously could have done. And it's also introduced safety benefits as well. So the risk of error has, has uh, been reduced by 50%. Uh, so this also lowers our operational and support costs because obviously um, by reducing the, uh, sorry, by increasing our capacity, we reduce the amount of manpower resources needed to run the operation. And by giving these aircraft uh, slicker, more efficient routings, we're reducing their CO2 emissions or their fuel burn. We've gone from paper to paperless. So you can see on the left here, um, the lady here is controlling with paper strips. That was in our terminal control room a few years ago. We've now moved to the bottom screen here where you can see the electronic flight strips. The flight strips are the ways in which the controllers will uh, annotate. You can see they've got a stylus there annotate the progress of the flight through the airspace, uh, recording all the instructions that are given to the pilot. This uh, way of digitizing it means that we can reduce our um, coordination between controllers. So that the controller next downstream and, and its flight path knows what's coming, can see what 
the previous controller has already done an input to the system. So it's reduced a lot of the coordination and it's also a good way of auditing what's, what's been done. On the right hand side, you can see the same uh, for the tower here. So you can see the old strip board um, here has now been placed by banks of screens. Uh, again, with touch screens and, and styluses, that's in Heathrow Tower. We've introduced something, a product called Intelligent Approach. Um, at Heathrow, the situation was that for 60 days a year, about 60 days, the headwinds can cause significant delays. The aircraft are slower on the final approach. Um, we use something we call distance-based separating, uh, where we'll separate the aircraft because of the vortex weight by a fixed distance. And that varies between um, the, the, the weight of the aircraft. Um, but in these head headwinds, the aircraft are slower on their final approach. So the rate of landing traffic is reduced. This means that passengers miss connections, there's a cost of hotel stopovers, rebooking or cancellations of flights, a big impact on our airlines and the airport or customers. So we've been looking at this, we've been studying uh, over 100,000 flights studied in a three year period and we looked at the vortex wake that was uh, created by these aircraft in those strong winds and what we observed is that uh, the strong winds are, uh, will dissipate those, those vortex uh, spirals. Because they're being dissipated we've, we've recognised we could bring the aircraft closer together and we've moved to something called time-based separation rather than distance-based separation um, to improve the landing rates but without eroding any safety. So the tool here you can see at the bottom has been helping the controllers achieve this. It gives them a, an indicator as to where they need to position the aircraft. This is the, these are the two final approach tracks into Heathrow which would sit here um, and the controller will aim for these moving targets that will uh, follow them down uh, or, or lead them down the final approach track. So you can see the next one's coming in here and there'll be a marker somewhere to, to tell that aircraft or the controller where to position that aircraft. So when we're in these strong winds with the application of this tool, we've achieved about 50% reduction in delays. But it doesn't stop there. We're keeping uh, innovating. We keep, we're now looking at not just the um, the type categories for the wake vortex, but we're now looking at the individual aircraft types and saying, can we introduce better fidelity into these separations that we're uh, creating? And we're working with regulators and we're working with CESAR um, on something called recat, recasterization of these wake vortex. And we're moving slowly towards uh, pairwise separations. So I have a short clip just to explain this a bit more easily. Currently, controllers must deliver fixed wake vortex spacing between all aircraft. Managing this manually can lead to overspacing or underspacing between arrivals, impacting safety and wasting runway capacity. By introducing a minimum separation indicator onto approach radar displays, controllers are able to space aircraft more accurately and improve the reliability of the arrival sequence. Lockheed Martin has supported the introduction of distance-based separation at 25 airports across the USA and now at London's Heathrow Airport. However, even with the minimum separation indicator, with fixed distance-based separation, headwinds result in a loss of capacity. To resolve this issue, Nats and Lockheed Martin have pioneered the concept of time-based separation, or TBS. TBS provides dynamic separation between arriving aircraft pairs specific to the prevailing wind conditions, greatly reducing the impact of headwinds on landing rates. TBS is expected to halve wind-related delays, greatly improving the resilience of the airport operation. Okay, moving on then. So what else have we been doing? We've, we've been operating unmanned aircraft in civil airspace. So you can see this uh, UAV here has been controlled by this lady here. It's this Cronus um, and it's been flying around here in, um, in controlled airspace. We were the first people to uh, bring unmanned aircraft under our supervision into controlled airspace. It was a UK first and a major milestone for the development of unmanned air aircraft systems. 
Today we've moved on further with this. We've been working with the Maritime Coast Guard Agency and we've been doing some trials uh, for the first unmanned search and rescue flights. So this drone, it's a Hermes 900, has a ceiling of about 30,000 feet and a cruise speed of about 65 knots. It operates out of uh, Aberporth in West Wales and it goes out through Irish, uh, through, through UK airspace and into the Irish airspace and then patrols uh, over the ocean um, in, in the, off, off the southwest coast of Ireland. Now this provides some challenging in itself because although its cruise speed is 65 knots, in the strong headwind that it's been facing in some of our trials, it's actually been flying around at a speed of about 20 knots. So this in itself presents a problem trying to integrate uh, something flying at 20 knots with um, civil aircraft flying around perhaps 400, um, 450 miles per hour, something like that. Uh, and we've got this very slow uh, aircraft operating in the same airspace. So these are challenges as well. We're also moving to create efficiencies from data, um, big data. So intelligent use of data to create capacity and efficiency both in the air and on the ground. So we're looking at, uh, we've got some tools that are already gone to market on some of these. Um, we've got one called airspace capacity enhancement, sorry, airport capacity enhancement, looking at ways of improving the flow around the airport, looking at ways of uh, measuring the taxiways and so on, um, the usage and so on. Um, we're all trying to move towards uh, better aeronautical information management, uh, standardised management of messaging to make sure that um, the more standardised we get these messages, uh, the better use they are in, in new technological concepts and uh, applications. We've got something called mission optimization services for our airlines where they can track more accurately where their aircraft fleet are and what would be the implications of moving that fleet around should they need to change the schedule at short notice. We're also looking at a tool called Airport Insights, which is looking at uh, primarily the run runway movements and looking at how well is the runway being utilised. Can we increase the capacity by um, turning aircraft off the runway quicker in a shorter amount of time? How much how much, is a how much time are the aircraft spending on the runway? Can we talk to the airlines to see if there's anything we can do to help them speed up their time on the runway to increase that throughput? We've also got a digital tower. So this is our London city tower. Um, this is actually in Swanwick. You can see uh, the controllers here sitting at the, the desks, looking out the window as if they were there at London City Airport. You can see the runway there with all the track mark, track data blocks on the aircraft in the in the sky. So this is the um, largest airport in the world to run a wholly digital air traffic control operation. Um, and we're looking to transition that uh, this winter where we'll complete our testing. But going forward, we've got something called uh, evolution system thinking, our fourth industrial revolution. So we've had steam and mechanization as our first uh, um, country nationwide uh, industrial revolution. And our second one would have been mass production around assembly lines, uh, factories and so on. And the third was about introducing the digital era and computing to replace some of those mechanised processes or manual processes. Now we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution where it's about system thinking, integrating human operations with systems and the internet of things. So what do we mean by that? We've split our um, vision up into three, physical, digital and biological. I'm going to walk you through these. Um, first of all, starting with physical. So we want to bring future life, uh, future travel to the life uh, of the passenger perspective. So you may have heard of smart cities. Um, this is all about managing traffic flows, transportation flows through the city. Um, in a smart way. We want to integrate uh, airports into this as well so that we can inform our passengers around um, the, the airport itself if there are any issues, if there's any problems with the airlines, anything like that. We can also start looking at how are our passengers getting to the airport? Are they held up on the, the, a train that's um, been, been held up? Has there been an accident on a motorway which has caused significant delays where an airline might actually think these passengers are going to be late for my aircraft. Um, there's a significant amount of my uh, 
passengers for this this flight, it might be worth delaying that aircraft. So it's just smarter thinking for for the benefit of all customers um, in in the aviation service. We also uh, introduced we're part of a consortium uh, called Aerion, um, and we're looking at satellite surveillance. So it might surprise you to realise that. Um, up until fairly recently, all air traffic was done by ground based radar uh, coverage. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've introduced satellite surveillance over the ocean. And this is going to introduce some new uh, concepts of how we work and control those planes. So previously, they were procedurally separated. So they'd enter the oceanic airspace, uh, the first flight on a certain track, a certain heading and level would be told to fly at one speed and the preceding aircraft would enter the same track, same level and heading and be told to fly the same speed or slower. The idea being that when they come out the other side of the oceanic control, there'll be the same separation or greater. With satellite surveillance, we can do a lot more smarter separations and we can start to apply some of the domestic separations that I talked about earlier, thereby increasing capacity over the ocean and also improving um, the environmental impact of flights by giving the aircraft and airlines uh, the most optimal profiles. We also need to look at the impact of drones on our operations, something that's now been labelled as urban traffic or mobility as a service where passengers would request transportation from A to B and they don't really mind how they get there. It could be a combination of railroad or air. They just want to go from A to B. Um, you can see uh, the picture here. With this is the uh, volocopter. This is in Dubai, and Dubai have now uh, regulated that the use of these uh, such aircraft uh, can can be used in the city. There's real estate in London being bought up for landing pads for such aircraft. We also need to look at the military use of these um, drones and how they would be integrated, as, as you saw previous slides. We're also using them on the airfield to inspect things. So to inspect things that we can't easily see from the ground, such as this um, instrument landing system that's being checked out in this picture here. We also need to protect ourselves from the misuse of drones. Um, we, can, we can help people with apps to help uh, provide alerts and inform people of where, um, where activity is taking place and where it shouldn't take place. And we can protect some of those by geofencing to um, prevent aircraft entering, uh, or sorry, I should say UAVs entering uh, the space where we want to operate aircraft. We've also got lots of new technologies coming. Now, some of you might realise that this top picture is actually the SR-71 Blackbird, which has been around for decades. So it's perhaps not that new. However, the ones at the bottom um, the Sabre rockets on the um, reaction engines and the Virgin Galactic, these are new and they will require um, a new way of thinking about how to control these high speed uh, aircraft. But it's not all high speed. We've got the low and the slow. Uh, and this company Airlander have, have uh, got these giant balloons that are carrying, capable of carrying cargo and passengers very slowly. How do we integrate all these things together? This requires us to be very innovative. We've also got the uh, advent of spaceports. So uh, over the next decade, there's been th nearly four billion pounds uh, pumped into the UK economy. And we're starting to see uh, airports now being labelled as the future spaceport. These are generally some of the longer, um, longer runways at less busy um, airports in the UK but they're gearing up for launches for the aircraft that you've perhaps seen in the, in the previous slide or even um, vertical launches. Moving on, building on our digital um, tower, we've, we've digital um, has two sorts of meanings. So there's a remote tower where you can operate a tower in a remote sense where you may be operating controlling aircraft from somewhere remote to where the location is. Um, but the digital element adds in some artificial intelligence. So we're working with a company called Sea Ridge. You can see Sea Ridge here. We've uh, introduced these labeling for the aircraft. So we've got more information that are tagging the aircraft as they move around the airport. We can block areas out. Like you can see here working 
progress on the uh, taxiway systems. And we can also introduce new technologies here, our Heathrow Digital Tower Lab. So we're introducing 4K, um, which is a world first uh, for digital towers. We're having pan tilt zoom cameras fitted. Um, we're looking at augmented reality, the label overlays, the runways, taxi outlines. Um, ideal if you're starting out as a new trainee air traffic controller, you can have all these labels on and slowly turn things off as you become more familiar. Or perhaps you just want to highlight something that's significant or poignant at the time. Some of the artificial intelligence overcomes some of the problems that we have, um, such as you can see here the tower, um, the very tall tower to get the, uh, the vista um, of, of the whole airport. But the problem is when we have days perhaps like today where there's low cloud or fog, it can be gin clear at the uh, ground level, but our tower is sitting in cloud and it can't see the runway. So we've got this picture here on the top right um, where we can see this aircraft here, this, this British Airways aircraft has just turned off the runway and the uh, artificial intelligence has highlighted this blue section over its tail, meaning that it's still infringing part of the runway. So it's not yet safe to land or take off until that aircraft has fully passed uh, that marker, which may not be visible in those um, lower uh, visibility type procedures. Um, we've also got taxiway monitoring, so introducing intelligence to, to monitor the taxiways and stand management and so on. All of this is being uh, operationally trialled in uh, Changi in China and uh, we're hoping to come online with that very soon. We're also looking at artificial intelligence. So we've got this diagram here where you have to project yourself right forward here to say what would automation of the ATCO look like? And we do this because we need to project further than, than is likely that we'll end up. Because if you think um, far into the future about your development, the chances are you'll fall somewhat short. So don't aim short, go high, go, go further. If you're going to think big, think bigger. So we want to design this ATCO agent and we're going to start by putting the ATCO agent into our college. Um, see if it can digest the, the, the tests that we put our controllers through um, and, and see if it, you know, we can train it using like gaming data. And then we can start to interject human centered design and give it some values and assess it as we would do for a normal trainee. Uh, gather the evidence and assure ourselves that it's behaving correctly. Of course, thinking that big introduces uh, some, some interim steps and some technologies along the way um, so that we can automate elements of it earlier. We can get some quick wins out of this longer term research. We've looked at mixed reality. We built a multi-user outer space lab so that we, um, we don't need to put people in our space rooms anymore. We can put them on a headset and show them around our product suite um, and show them inside our product suite here. We've got the artificial reality of Heathrow or Dubai in this case. Um, we've got a tabletop of, of Heathrow. We can make this uh, all work in real time and feed it with, with data in real time to see what the aircraft are doing through uh, a, a virtual or augmented reality headset. We're looking at biological data too. We want to see um, are our humans performing at the optimum. Um, we want to make sure that we're looking after our controllers. We're making sure that they are not overworked or fatigued, that we understand better how to manage those fatigue levels. And we can identify fatigue perhaps earlier than uh, we, we would have done. Uh, at the moment, we're regulated by um, uh, something called Scratco. And Scratco is stipulation of, of hours for controllers that was designed in the 1960s. We want to gather evidence to suggest that that data may not, might, may not be right. So there's benefits here for both safety because we're looking after our controllers and how uh, the workload they're managing. And we're also looking at the benefit of capacity. Can they handle more? So um, I'm getting near to the end now and uh, I'm going to talk about the impact that COVID has had on our future plans. So for this tiny microscopic particle, it certainly had a massive impact on our global economy. Uh, aviation in particular has severely suffered. 
obviously we've reduced revenues and profitability uh, because our, our income comes um, from every flight we get paid per flight. So there's a short video here. I'll just start. This is showing Good Friday. On the left hand side, you can see how it was last year. On the right hand side, you can see this year. So if you look at this on a graph, you can see across the top here, we're looking at the variation in uh, flights in 2019. You can see these regular dips are at the weekend when it's quieter. Um, if you compare that to this year, you can see there's a dramatic difference here. The red line being the weekly average. Um, you can see that during that video um, or slightly after that time, we got to our lowest variation in traffic from the norm of minus 94%. Today or only the other day, it was down to minus 74%. So it has picked up uh, a bit. Our expectation is it is still going to grow. But at the moment, we need to plan on anticipated scenarios. We can't tell what the future is. Um, so we're continuing to reduce our expenditure. Our prior priorities are helping to support our employees, helping to support the business and our customers and suppliers. If you look at this graph on the right here, you can see the downturn in traffic for each of our airports. And you can see that the London airport is most severely affected over 90% over uh, less traffic than, than, than what they would have been um, having last, last year. So future support, so our airspace is part of our critical national um, infrastructure. So we need to keep open at all times and we need to keep it safe not least for the continued flow of food, medicines and supplies. Any support package that might come for aviation must include the payment of ATC charges that we're missing and our revenue shortfall for the period um, since, since the pandemic started. We're part of a European um, network operations recovery plan and this is coordinated through our regulators, the CAA, through the industrial, uh, sorry, the industry resilience group. And we're also involved with our government uh, in the restart and recovery group for the UK aviation industry, working alongside our partners, customers and supply chain. This graph shows the variation in traffic uh, just recently this week for each of our centres. Um, with furloughed staff, the objective here being to continue providing the critical national service uh, whilst retaining the capability and expertise for the organisation to recover when the traffic comes back. We've enrolled over 50% of our employees through the job retention scheme and about 40% of those have included our frontline employees. We've cut back on training. Our training college is effectively closed for the uh, next two years at least. And we've had 270 trainees that have already passed through the college um, and they will complete their live training um, as that will cover the demand on the operation for several years, uh, balanced by uh, staff attrition through retirements and so on. This graph shows how the UK is comparing to um, air traffic uh, providers across Europe. And you can see we're, we're some of the worst hit, probably because we are the busiest uh, airspace. We're going through uh, redundancies. Our customers obviously expect nets to be right sized for the operational demand, but it's also critical for us to have enough staff to fully support recovery when the traffic comes back. We just recently executed a VR program, voluntary redundancy for all our uh, non-operational staff, um, but we've had to ensure that we've retained the capabilities still to deliver safe and efficient service. Through that program, um, 400 employees have left the business this year and I must stress here that Nats always act responsibly towards our employees. At the same time we need to be able to respond to the requirements of a changing world that creates a sustainable Nats for years to come. 
So our focus now is about prioritising innovation today, which is the key to unlocking a post-crisis growth. So we need to adapt to our, to our shifting customer needs. At the moment, the industry is in a state of survival. We've already lost some customers and we need to help protect the supply chain and our other customers and our new customers. We need to identify, address weak, uh, sorry. We need to identify and address new opportunity areas uh, created by the changing landscape, the impact that this is having. We do lots of what we call weak signal monitoring, seeing how change is happening, uh, horizon scanning or tech hunting, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're out there looking to see um, what the trends are for the future. We're re-evaluating our portfolio and balancing resources accordingly, it's effectively a stop start continue. We're pausing work. We're continuing with our business critical work, so the operations, sustainment of our infrastructure uh, and any contractual obligations with customers um, is being maintained. So our innovation has somewhat shifted inwards for now. So some of the programmes I talked about tonight have been paused. We hope to restart some of those. Um, but at the moment, we need to build foundations uh, for a post-crisis growth. We need to simplify. We need to lean internal processes. And we're identifying the efficiencies to streamline our business uh, to become uh, more sustainable. But the future is bright. It certainly is today. Um, we've had, we support the development of common biosecurity standards at airports and so on, uh, reducing the need to quarantine travellers whilst ensuring that it's still safe for people to visit Britain. And today we've had the vaccine being rolled out. So this is a strong boost to air travel and uh, confidence for passengers uh, to, to use aviation. Our airlines are confident that the growth will return and we're working very closely with our airlines in that conversation and with our regulators too. We need to build back better. This is our opportunity right now to improve safely whilst the traffic is quiet. This is a unique set of circumstances where we can introduce change to our airspace to match how, how our customers are going to change using the airspace. We've got um, new airlines emerging, taking out the routes of, of some of the aircraft, uh, some of the airlines that have unfortunately uh, had to go. Um, we've got new aircraft on new routes. We've got new airspace users coming up, um, as we talked about the drones and so on. We've got environment, big emphasis. Um, we want to be net zero by 2050, and we want to aim to reduce noise as well at our airports. Um, the airlines are on board with this. They're all working to create new aircraft like electronic, uh, electric aircraft and hydrogen powered aircraft. So how are we going to adapt and accommodate those? That's where our innovation focus needs to be right now. So this pretty much concludes. Um, I just got one last video to show you a short one that just demonstrates the capability of the innovation team in NATS.
that brings me to the end. Um, I'll take some questions. I think Paul's going to help with that. But I'd like to say thank you all for listening and uh, I'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that. Um, if you'd like to ask some questions, if you want to type them in, I've got some uh, lined up already that have come through as you've been uh, uh, talking. Um, I'm just going to select those uh, now. Um, quite a variety of questions here. Uh, I think a couple of you might have addressed anyway. Um, one of our uh, colleagues is, uh, says, one of the minor irritations of flying is being stacked at Gatwick and Heathrow. Why does it happen and is it can it be made unavoidable? Uh, with our current infrastructure, the answer is is no. Um, obviously, that's something we're looking to improve. Um, but yeah, you can probably see from those videos just how congested the airspace is. Um, and the runway only has a finite capacity, uh, as does the airport and taxiways. And um, at the moment, our solution is, is to stack or to hold, hold the aircraft in the air. We, we have got um, some tools in place currently to reduce some of that by slowing the aircraft down further back in their flight. So we can look and predict uh, delays and uh, start to slow some of those inbound aircraft before they come into the UK airspace. We do that with our uh, partnering uh, air navigation service providers as well. OK, thank you for that. Um, a historic one now then. Uh, what special arrangements, if any, were made to handle Concorde? Oh, crikey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, my wife's an air traffic controller. Um, she's actually, uh, she used to uh, regularly talk to Concorde as it flew out over the Bristol Channel. Um, yeah, Concorde was very unique. Um, once it uh, got up to speed where it was going to accelerate to supersonic speed, it needed plenty of room. Um, and because of the design of the aircraft, um, when it go when it when it's in that transitionary phase, it needs to rebalance um, to get the centre of gravity right. So it needs to redistribute the fuel in the wings. Um, and as it was doing that, um, <laughs> it can't take any headings or turns. So uh, once it had the ATC clearance to accelerate, that was it. It was going like a rocket, <laughs> and the controllers would watch the numbers on the uh, radar screen go all the way up. And then suddenly it would say XXX because it was going faster than the uh, <laughs> the system would record. Um, so yeah, once it was accelerating, that was it. You could not turn it. So you had to be pretty certain um, it was good and clear to accelerate. Um, so that was that was the main thing really. Um, once it was up there, it was uh, out of the way of most of our traffic. Okay. Um, a question on automation. I mean, which I think you started covering with the unmanned towers and stuff. Do you foresee a future where we don't need uh, controllers? Um, that's a very interesting question, yes. Um, I think it's a long way off, off coming. I certainly think we could have uh, more system integration into how we uh, control. Um, it's, it's riddled with complexity. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the future is there, but we need to do it safely. You know, we want to innovate in a responsible way and make sure that um, we're doing things in the right way. And we have to jump through lots of safety regulations and, and we're happy to do that. You know, we're, um, it, it's, it's a prime uh, importance to Nets to retain a safe service. So we won't, we won't introduce anything until it's certainly well proven. Uh, and tested and, and approved by the regulator. OK, seems reasonable. Uh, a question that is also very topical, I would say, is uh, will leaving the EU change anything? I think people forget we have left the EU, but I think we're talking about <laughs> end of transition. Uh, yes, uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, and the answer is we're not sure at the moment. However, uh, we have very good relationships with our European partners. Uh, we're in, embedded in lots of um, partnerships, such as CESAR, the um, Single European Skies Initiative. Um, those relationships, I don't think, are going to change because of Brexit. These are uh, business relationships, uh, uh, partnerships and agreements that have been put into place. 
Um, and I think that uh, we're well respected in Europe and uh, our regulators are working with European regulators to make sure that um, nothing untoward happens to those relationships because of Brexit. OK. Uh, slightly different uh, topic. Um, do you market your newly developed innovation systems to other air traffic controllers? Uh, sorry, air traffic organisations around the world as a way of generating more income? Yes, we do. Um, we, um, I'm just trying to think how to answer that. I think I think it's probably fair to say politically some wouldn't be interested in uh, buying from from com competition that they might see. Um, <laughs> however, we do work uh, globally and uh, we do lots of consultancy uh, where we bring in uh, some of our tools. So the the intelligent approach system that I've talked about um, has been introduced at Toronto. Um, so the Canadians have embraced that and um, we've got the digital tower work going on in Changi in, in China. Um, so yes, we're, we're definitely open to collaborating um, and, and selling abroad. OK, another quite broad question here. So in your opinion, what's been the greatest innovation in aviation history? Oh my goodness, um, you caught me out here because I know that was put on our website. Um, <laughs> I've thought about this quite a few times. I don't, I don't actually know. There, there have been a number of things. I think um, there's just been so many. I think, you know, radar being the, the first and obvious one and then the introduction of uh, the data, the, the secondary radar surveillance. I think the um, the sort of next next breaking thing will be how we use the satellite surveillance coverage. The fact that we've got now data, um, a global set of data to position aircraft. I think that opens a lot of opportunities for new innovations um, that we can build applications using that data, uh, host it in the cloud, and then uh, we, we can feed that into any operation worldwide. I think that has a masses of potential going forward. OK, uh, I've got one for the uh, future here. So obviously it looks like hypersonics are starting to come along. I think the uh, there's more blurring of what will become what you would call as aircraft versus spacecraft. I guess two parts of the question. What's your what altitude do you currently cover up to? And do you envisage it going into well near space or out the out of space sounds a bit extreme, but you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. to, to cover that new technology. It's an interesting question because um when I worked in a, a, a ATC procedures, um this this question used to come up because Historically, they used to write on airspace charts that um, the boundaries, the vertical boundaries of the airspace would go up to something that used to be labelled as unlimited. Um, and the reality of that was, it, of course, it wasn't unlimited. It did have a limit and um, the upper airspace goes up to uh, flight level 660 or 66,000 feet. Um, there's not much up there. There's not much getting in the way. Um, I think my wife said she's spoken to an aircraft that was at 51,000 feet, and that's the highest she's ever seen anything. <laughs> I guess that will be the challenge as uh, I say more and more uh, uh, space type uh, uh, travel. Yeah. Getting to Australia in two hours rather than <laughs> a day uh, starts uh, taking off. Yeah, exactly. OK, um, this is the last call for any more questions because uh, we're getting on, it's getting towards nine o'clock, so I do want to uh, uh, start wrapping this up. Um, I guess a quick question. On a lot of your video, your videos, your pictures, we saw the ground control and uh, it was always a clear sunny day. And we talk, you mentioned in your presentation about when you're using cameras and stuff, they can't see through the fog. So how do you control the taxiing of the aircraft around the airfield when it's foggy because they still do land in fog. I've seen them. I've been on them. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, another good question. Um, everything slows down a lot in fog um, because the pilots can't see. They can't see whether they're taxiing. If, it, if it's really bad, we can send out follow me vehicles and so on. 
um, but we revert to what we call low visibility procedures. So it's much more uh, procedural how we, we, we sort of separate the aircraft. Um, some of the um, instructions we give are limited in, in, vis in low visibility procedures so that the flow around the airport is, is reduced a lot. Um, but you know the pilots themselves are going to taxi slower um, and they perhaps need more help to navigate so um, you sometimes have to give them non-standard instructions like take the next left. <laughs> <laughs> and they just got to cross their fingers and hope right. <laughs> but no we, we, we do we still have surveillance we still monitor them um, electronically so we've got um, ground movement radar and we can see where they are on the ground so you, you know we can still track them where they are uh, but obviously we do it in a slower more cautious way okay uh, and i've got uh, another question coming here which is uh, there's been lots of talk about aircraft taking far more responsibility for their own control based on swarm theory is this actually ongoing uh yeah we, we this is something we're aware of and we're looking into um at the moment, it's too it's too early um, that that it's going to have an impact uh, in the short term. Um, I think the nearest thing to that that we're considering is formation flights, particularly over the ocean. Um, the benefits being if you can fly aircraft in formation, um, the preceding aircraft uh, are in the you know they're kind of getting a toe, aren't they? They've they've got less less drag to overcome. Um, so their fuel burn is less and they can sort of jockey for position at the front who's going to lead the formation um, and take the biggest hit on the drag um, but overall that would reduce the drag and it also increases the capacity in the system because obviously we can get more planes in the sky by doing that so um, I know it's something that Airbus have been looking at and it's something that we're looking at in our R&D team. Excellent uh, well I think we'll call it uh uh time there uh chris thanks thanks very much for your uh, support and giving us this presentation uh very, I found it very useful and I, I think i'll probably the uh, other attendees did as well so thank you very much and good night to everyone a quick reminder the next one of these we'll be doing will be the 12th of january which will be uh, by chris uh, burkett who's going to talk to us about aer um, aerobatic flying worldwide by night and day so again should be quite interesting should be some interesting videos as well so please do join us we will send out the uh, link um, you only need to use the link you don't need to pre-register uh, so i will see you all then thank you very much